Hello and welcome back to week 10 of the Hearthstone Global Games. As we're about to continue the saga of Group F, we just witnessed Denmark and France, both of their final games, and Denmark's elimination from the tournament. Next up, Canada versus Kazakhstan. Now, Canada are already through, Kazakhstan are already out, but if Canada win this, they're going to win the group. I'm Falcone, joined once again by Lorinda. Let's take a look at Group F so we can hopefully prove what I just said. Yeah, and just shows there that Canada will indeed win the group if they win this match. Kazakhstan will be the only 0-5 team in the competition, and Neyman doesn't want that country to be all about Borat. So he'd better win, <laughs> or we'll make it all about Borat. <laughs> yep, that's that's a pretty good reason, I think. That's a pretty good reason to want to win this series. So stakes are high for both players. As you mentioned before, Canada are going to want to win this group right. because them, them getting a good seeding means they're in a great position moving forwards into the next phase of the Hearthstone Global Games. It means they're more likely to get matched up against the groups that did worse in, um, in phase one of the competition, and therefore they've got a better chance of getting through to the single elimination bracket. Yeah, we've seen a lot of the teams that maybe not so well known have gone through on maybe three and two wins a lot of the time. So getting that number one seed and trying to get matched up against those teams that maybe the slightly lesser lights, that is where you want to be. And look at this lineup from Canada. Cydonia, APX Void, Hot Form and Purple, without a doubt, one of the best teams in the event. Some names you may have heard of there. Cydonia was a competitor at BlizzCon last year. Hotform came second place in BlizzCon, or the World Championship, rather, 2015. So some faces that you should have seen there. Cydonia actually won me a pack or two. Not many, but he won me a few packs last year. Olypex Void, the equivalent of Diz Demon in America's, uh, he had the most wins in the preliminary slash playoffs. Maybe Amnesiac had one more, actually. I used to have that stat to hand. I don't at the moment, but Apex Void, a huge number of playoff wins and a Tempo Mage god. On the other side of things, though, uh, lesser known players, but still some players you may have heard of, specifically the first one, the anchor, Naaman, first place Hearthstone Winter Championship 2016 performances in Seat Story Cup, Kinwin for Charity, Star Series, even Gfinity back in 2015 in the United Kingdom. This guy has a lot of Hearthstone pedigree himself. Yeah, and Kazakhstan, the rest of their team, Hallmark, Jipatox, and Smoto Kotik, also no slouches that we've seen, and they've improved as this has gone on as well. I think they've enjoyed the learning experience of the Hearthstone Global Games. The question is, have they improved enough? It's so important for them to get one win. They do not want Kazakhstan to just be a laughing matter, which is apparently what you want to turn it into. I don't want to. It's just what I might end up having to do to well, the amount maintain of shots, interest. The amount of shots you've been firing today, Neil, I wouldn't be too surprised. Yeah, I'm not I'm having sure. to, like, duck and avoid them over here. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> you, won't, you won't be able to avoid them when they come your way. When? <laughs> when they come my way? That's a new thing that hasn't happened yet. Right. right. So, yeah, but no team wants to go 0-5 in any event. But I know that Naaman is very proud. Uh, keep talking about Naaman as if it's a one-player team, but he is... With all intents and purposes, a big carry for this he, team. He is. He's the name in the same way that RDU was the name in the Romanian team. Uh, it's something that we're finding with a few of them. There can only be so many super popular players, and it's kind of their job to show what the rest of their team is capable of. I mean, let's not mess around here. Hallmark um, has been in all three of the 2016 preliminaries. I haven't got the 2017 data, but he is a player that has played a lot of high-quality Hearthstone. You know, he played in WSG Korea in Seoul. He was a player trying to represent over there as well. He is good at this game, but because Naaman is so high profile, it does all become about him at times. Welcome to the Hearthstone Global Games format. If you're seeing it for the first time, it may look a little bit complicated, but I'll try and explain it as clear as I can. Uh, each player is given two classes, except for one of the players on each team who has three classes. He's the ace player. He'll be playing a second time if we get to the fifth game in the best out of five. Uh, the players have decided what order they're playing in beforehand. They've decided how the classes will be distributed. And now it's a blind pick. So Sidonia has just been told he's got to play against Jypertox. He's been told what his opponent's two classes are. They now need to decide which one class they're going to take. So Sidonia is going to be Paladin or Mage. But Jypertox is going to be Priest or Mage. The reason he has Paladin and Mage together, if you're wondering, well, they're two good classes. What's going on there then? is because if he does get to the ace match, he will get the Warlock added into the mix and will need a second strong class. Yes, because 
the uh, the secret rule of the Hearthstone Global Games is that nobody wants to play Warlock. That's the rule you're not supposed to talk about. Sorry, I I, I just I just said it. Y you could have told me that before. They weren't, yeah. Okay, let's Nobody take a look and see which classes have been picked. Okay, no no eater of secrets mages today, as Sidonia and Jibatox both picked the other class. It's going to be Paladin versus Priest. And I feel as though we've seen a lot of Priests today. Seen a lot more Priests today than we have done maybe yesterday, maybe last week. I think going back three or four weeks, I think the Priest was probably one of the more played classes, but it slowly slid out of... Whatever it was sliding out of, I don't Rotation. know. Rotation, sure, Rotation let's go with we'll that. Go with. Uh, I think yesterday we saw one priest, unless I'm really misremembering that. I, I remember a silence priest, and that's that's all I can remember from yesterday. There weren't many. I think we saw a couple. There may have been one. Yeah, there, right. there weren't many. Uh, as we see the players there ready, both sat on their own, but with their teammates there in spirit and in their ears. Um, both of which are pretty terrifying prospects, if you think about that too literally. <laughs> Don't forget, Hearthstone Global Games is a team tournament, as Neil was just saying. All through every game that you'll watch in the Hearthstone Global Games, they will be hooked up some way or another to their teammates, talking to them, advising them, taking advice from them, all of that stuff. Some of the teams have even said to us in the interviews, you know, it doesn't even matter which one of us is piloting. We're all playing every single right. game together. So we don't really like it when you refer to us as the individual. You should always talk about what we're doing as a team because it's often not the individual making all the decisions. But while we're waiting for them to get ready, let's talk about an individual for a moment. Sidonia, he's a player that since he had his big result and got to BlizzCon, I feel he's doing a lot of things right in terms of being a pro player. He's active in social media. Mm -hmm. His stream is growing. He streams a lot of hours. He streams a lot of informative Hearthstone. Mm -hmm. There's two types of streams that people like to watch. Mm -hmm. There's the players who tell, teach you stuff, and there's the players who mess about. He joins that's why this guy's toast is so popular, because he does both. He joins Team Solo mid as well. He joined Team Solo mid because back on the, on the strength of that streaming, I think. And now he's traveling around playing a lot of tournaments. And he is just like the consummate professional at the moment. All right. All week I've been talking about this deck. And here it is. This is the control priest that I've been talking about. Dirty Rat is a very clear indicator to me that that's what we're about to see. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier the Crystalline Oracle yep. as well. Just... The priest version. Everyone seems to have one these days. Of the priest one one that steals cards or, or adds cards. Priest one one that gives you a card <laughs> at random. Blah blah blah. Uh, priest one obviously one of the better ones in some ways, given that it actually comes out of a deck. You wait until we get the uh, warrior one one that gives you a pirate. Isn't that just called Captain's Parrot? Anything with patches. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. That's true. <laughs> Any pirate at all does that. Oh, Tyrion being picked up there. Uh, Jibadox throws away dirty rats, so uh, it makes a lot of sense, actually. Both of these players got nice-looking curves going into the first couple of turns. They're going to have time to pick up the rest of their curve. So let's see how this one develops. This is a diff difficult matchup to predict, actually. Uh, Depends how heavy the Paladin is. I'm not sure if it runs Rockpool Hunters, or maybe if it's maybe it could even run us off. It could be on that scale of things. It's hard to tell at the moment. It also depends on just how heavy the Priest is teched. As I said, some of them are running Mind Control more recently. This may be an addition that's been made uh, since deck submissions happened, but if it is running Mind Control and they can grab extra Mind Controls from Shadow Visions, the amount of value that they can not only add to their deck but steal from their opponents could sneak them a win. Yeah, it's a massive turnaround in stats if you can just steal a Tyrion from your opponent. You know, it's 12 stats leaving, 12 stats coming to you, that's 24. How do you factor the Divine Shields and Ashbringers as well? Right. It's just an enormous amount of numbers and just for 10 mana, 10 mana should swing the game, of course. That's, mm -hmm. that's the whole point. argument that was about Yogg for so long as well. It's a 10 mana card, but it just turned out it was a little bit too good and had to just be sort of snipped back a little bit. So, Noble Sacrifice Redemption, Getaway Kodo. This is Getaway Kodo, right? Looks like it's going to be a value-based matchup, so... You could argue that Redemption is fine if you play it with Tyrion. If he's running Nazoth, it makes no difference, right? You still get the second Tyrion, you still get the second Tyrion when Nazoth comes down. Yeah, they also do have that Wick of Flame as well, so the Redemption early on would have been okay there, just because of the Divine Shield coming back, but yeah. Noble Sacrifice, though. Yeah, just declaring their intention to look after this board, basically. Hmm. I guess the uh, the Valfin Inquisitor does now indicate that it's not a control heavy. It's not a uh, mm -hmm. it's not a Nazoth 
version of the deck. Mm. It's going to be running more Murlocs, probably Gentle Megasaur. It's more mid-rangey. Yeah, like the original version that um, Cross slash Strife Crow were playing uh, when Murlocs were first added to Paladin outside of the Anything right. shell, of course. And looks like it's that throwback for now. Uh, wait, wait and see whether they're playing Ragnaros, whether they're playing Finger. They're the two question marks. And maybe one equality finds its way in in this particular build. Yeah. Well, it's there. There's one in the hand. I don't know if it's running two or one, but... Sure. It is actually just <laughs> sitting there looking at me. Well done, Neil. Uh, it's happened. I'm sure I did the same thing yesterday. Okay, so Jopatox not getting the the bump and buff, instead choosing to go for the powered shield. And just get the Oracle down, get in the process of get some information and maybe get a huge card out of it as well. Gentle Megasaur there for Canada, slightly off curve, but if he can uh, cause these two Murlocs to stick around, he's going to get a pretty nice swing from it. So, I, I mean, the play this turn looks very obvious, right? It just looks like you'd throw down the three drop. What do you think he's thinking about? I mean, you can roll the hero power and play the Noble Sacrifice. You've taken the Noble Sacrifice to get an early board. Uh, one thing you can do to get that early board is to play the Murloc now from your hero power, play Noble Sacrifice, bump away the Crystalline Oracle, and then you have three minions, all of which are Murlocs, next turn right. to get buffed by the Megasaur. Okay, yep, gonna go with that. So now he has to take down the Crystalline Oracle to make sure there's only one minion which has to attack into the Noble Sacrificers. Noble Sacrificer. And then he'll be able to get the full Megasaur value. And this was planned when he took that Noble Sacrifice on turn two. That was a very nice alternative, I guess, play from Sidonia there. It looks like it's gonna have worked out very nicely. So while Jaipatox wins the value game in this matchup, Sidonia going to be trying to pressure Jaipatox as early as possible and just force his health down. So Jaipatox probably gonna draw a card here, then he will likely coin out a shadow word pain because he'll be able to see the position is going from bad to worse. And then if that does happen, Canada will play the Gentle Megasaur. They'll be looking for Poisonous. They'll be looking for attack buffs. Uh, they'll be looking for quite a lot of things, most of which are pretty good. Okay. Let's see what he gets from the Glimmer Root. Which one is it going to be? <coughs> uh, that's looking pretty obvious to me now. Yep, Spike Ridge Steed, a card that goes pretty much in all Paladin decks. It's unfortunately it's not a discover effect as... Is something that I always try and make it do. Surprised they didn't try and tidy this up, but let's see how this works out. Harrison Jones is also going to be okay at some point here if there is a Medivh in this deck. Which there should be. There, there 100% should be. So yeah, Harrison Jones is going to be handy later. Gentle Megasaur going to grant plus one, plus one stealth or death rattle. This is actually tough. It's the one, one or death rattle. I think I like the one, one, but I'm not sure. One, one allows them to take down the... Northshire Cleric fairly easily. That's something they'll want to do with it being stuck on three health. Uh, those things can take over the game. And yeah, these trades just work out reasonably nicely. Not fantastic, but nice enough. Yeah, you trade the uh, you trade the Val the Valfin Inquisitor and the token into Northshire Cleric. You trade the I always forget that card that is it's not a historian. No. Which card? The the secret one. I don't know why I forget that card's name. The one that just traded in. The two mana Merlock, grab a secret, discover a secret. Oh, the Hydrologist? Hydrologist! For some reason, that card's name always slips my mind at these vital moments. Interesting. Okay, Shadow Visions. Oh, so death is going to be tempting just to deal with the Megasaur right now, but... Yeah, you can't really afford to take free from Amber here. Yeah, death also will be tempting. There'll be probably two in this deck, I assume, now. Yeah. Um, and you've got plenty of targets. Sometimes, in a lot, of, one of the reasons that death rotated out of a lot of priest decks for a long time is that most decks don't have many targets for it these days. Right. This deck isn't one of those decks. This deck has plenty of targets for a Shadow Word Death, so you don't mind having an extra one. Yeah, there's a few right in front of me right now. There's the Tyrion in hand. There's the Harrison Jones. There's the Gentle Megasaur on the board, which is going to get deathed immediately. Using up the coin must feel quite painful when you've got Lyra in hand, but it just seemed like a necessity. I wonder if he was looking for Potion of Madness. 
yeah, that would have been a nice pickup for sure. Uh, sometimes I'm not even sure you know what you're looking for. I think that Hoy did earlier. I think he was looking for a shield. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I think you're just looking for any old card and see what you're offered because you know it's going to be good for you, whatever comes up. It's frustrating because you then play the Elise on five, probably, and then after that you could have gotten uh, an Angoro pack from the Shadow Visions. Though Jaipotox wins the value game anyway, Team Kazakhstan are just looking to survive for as long as they possibly can. Yeah, Canada taking a moment to think about this because of Harrison. Uh, they've just seen Kazakhstan panic to get a Shadow Word death, mm -hmm. so Harrison would probably have sat on the board and lived. Uh, plenty of ways of getting rid of it, but the, the feeling would be that it would have stuck, but Planning ahead, Medivh is just too important to get rid of the weapon. You don't want to play the dirty rat right now, Kazakhstan. <coughs> you do not want to play that card. I guess they start... I guess you could play Elise. You play Elise, or you start with the Glimmer Root and see what you grab. I guess Glimmer Root plus Shadow Word Pain is an option. Yeah, Glimmer Root, Shadow Word Pain, you're still on 23. You're not scared like you would be against Shaman of a Bloodlust in the face. Gonna go for it. Oh. How this priest maintains its hand size. If it gets to play all these cards in its hand, it will win the game. It's going to struggle, though, because Sidonia really is developing quite a force of a board. Oh, I wonder which card the Paladin puts in his deck. Well, well, that changes things a little. There is a Harrison Jones, though, which will deal with the Ashbringer later on, if it it's not dealing will. with the Medivh. And double equality will take care of other things as well. And huh, that's that is a stroke of luck, that right there. It worked out nicely for them. Yeah, it's not a discover effect, as I always have to remind myself, let alone anybody watching. And yeah, getting that one in 30 is very tasty. I'm never sure if it is a one in 30 or if it's a uh, if, if dub doubles count as one, I assume the doubles count as two. Yeah, probably. I imagine the deck list listed as one to 30, right. And it then picks a number. That makes sense. Okay, well, looks like a pretty clean turn for Elise. Hovered straight over it, but gonna wait. Check it through with his teammates. You see a lot of roping in the Hearthstone Global Games. That's because everyone on every team wants to make sure that all their teammates are happy with the moves that are being played. At least one of the best animations in Ongoro. I think everyone agrees on that one. Mm -hmm. Can defend these minions now with the Curator in the short term. Obviously, that doesn't end well with Dragonfire Potion, but it's okay. Got to play it, got to draw through your deck anyway. I'm not sure that the Curator on the other side is actually going to pick up any cards. Right. Uh, possibly a Primordial Drake, but I can't think of... I don't think that's even... Nece that's not even necess nece necessarily in the deck. Right. Got the word out eventually. Spirit Steed just looks so strong from Jaipotox this next turn, though. He's finally managed to get a minion to stick. So, you've got to take advantage while you can. Shadow Word Death number two, but it's number one really because the first one was picked up from a Shadow Vision. Yep. And a difficult turn to, to maximize, but an easy turn to do something. Spike Ridge Steed looks absolutely fine. And that may be enough to just summon the first equality from the hand of Sidonia, but he'll do everything he can not to have to do that. He can trade his board and that true silver champion in now. Take seven to the face. He won't be scared of that taking damage to the face at all no. if it helps him build up a board. <sighs> so, is it safe enough to just drop Tyrion here? I think against priests, when you're against a priest that you're not entirely sure what it runs, you maybe do want to drop Tyrion as early as possible because you don't want to wait until turn 10 where it might be mind controlled. You know that a few turns ago, they probably didn't have Shadow Word Death. That's not the greatest read in the world no. by any stretch. But yeah, I think you dropped Tyrion here. I think this is the correct play. It's going to work out hideously for them, but I, th I think it's the right thing to do. If it does prevent Jaipotox from dropping his Tyrion on the other side. It's funny. I mean, Sidoni is not going to be expecting that. He's not actually playing around a Tyrion. But uh, the way it works out, if Jaipotox now drops Tyrion, he wouldn't be able to deal with Sidonia's Tyrion, and it, it just would not be ideal. There's no good way here for Kazakhstan to deal with the Ashbringer, and that would be a, no. an issue for them. I mean, they have Curator, Dirty Rat, and Tyrion. 
you know, the Ashbringers has got plenty of things to bump into that aren't the face. I was I was just about to say, is it worth dropping Lyra first? You've got a taunt in the way, which is then going to spawn another taunt. Maybe it's going to be your best chance to start this chain of spells going. Shepardox goes for it, but there are two equalities in Sedania's hand, but he can't play them with a board clear. So actually, Kazakhstan going to be heavily rewarded for this. Yeah, next turn, of course, is an easy clear here for Canada. Um, but at the moment, no way through. Options, options. options indeed. You can swing the Ashbringer in and then maybe give the Murloc poisonous or maybe a quality in trade, but he's still not getting rid of Lyra, no matter which one of those moves he makes. He's not quite getting through to the main target. Very nice play there, I think, from Team Kazakhstan. Spotting that it's just a clean Lyra turn. Interesting to see here how Sidonia decides to deal with this. Because he'll be thinking of equality into Primordial Drake next turn. Right. And so he won't want to commit too much here, but also he's got a handful of things that need to do something. Very interesting to see how he decides to proceed. No getaway Kodo there, unfortunately. Tyrion's already gone, so Redemption not even going to do all that much, but he's going to have to do something. Now, Kazakhstan, I imagine, going to play as many spells as they possibly can this turn. Yeah, the danger when you're playing a big Lyra turn is to get into Auctioneer mode. Right. Auctioneer, you can pretty much not mess it up if you do it in the right order with the right spells and the right order. Like you play your preparations before your Fan of Knives. You yeah. pretty much get good value whatever you do. With Lyra, there's a lot more thought required sometimes in that actually sometimes less is more. Just getting a couple of good things done can be better than just spamming through for the sake of it. Right. That's what we're seeing here. As we can see from <laughs> this pick, Charged Devil Saw is the only good one because the whole board gets cleared by a quality um, Primordial Drake next turn anyway. Charged Devil Saw dealing seven damage to the face immediately is the only uh, thing that actually does anything. Just to clarify on that, by the way, it is a battle cry that says it can't hit the face the turn yep. it's played. It doesn't get its battle cry when it comes from the Free From Amber, so it could hit the face straight away. Important okay. distinction there. Yeah. Uh, again, Canada now, the threat of something dragony appearing from hand. Oh, this is the other Deathwing anyway, right? Yeah. Hmm. Which is... Kind of odd as well. Because you might as well take the, the one that scares your opponent. Maybe he doesn't want to summon any dragons he gets from the hand. We I mean, there's, there's a good him. chance he just doesn't run right. any. But he could grab one from the curator, essentially. Right. But here we go. Very obvious turn there. So I don't need to take a deep breath as well. I'm not sure there's anything going on. And he's just forcing through that damage. Won't be expecting this Tyrion that I suspect is about to come down there. Will he mind it, though? Like Spite Ridge Steed into Harrison isn't is eleven mana. That's a problem for him, but Tyrion plus power word shield is pretty good. He can just get rid of this Tyrion and then I with the quality and yeah. just drop Harrison and not be in the worst spot in the world here. Yeah, that's true. You have to take some damage in the process, has to have to use up the last Ashbringer. It's not entirely free, but I agree with you, it's it's not the end of the world for Sidonia. This game, his deck certainly still has a lot more to it. Yeah, remember, if he uses this Harrison, he will not be able to deal with Atiesh later. The way he'll be looking to deal with that will be by killing his opponent mm -hmm. before it is played. And if he doesn't do that Harrison play, that will be why. Mm. That being said, three swings of Ashbringer, you might argue, are going to be as dangerous as three spells that generate things from Atiesh anyway. Yeah, that's true. So maybe you don't mind, maybe you want the short term. I think it depends which spells. <laughs> uh, free from Amber already been used by Jypatox, and I believe that was actually drawn. So the fact that that's been used up does dramatically reduce the amount of carnage that Medivh's Atiesh can cause. Yeah. Remember, um, look at Shadow Visions now. Mind Control still in the deck. Mm -hmm. Um, the pack is still in the deck. Did we see it, Mind Control? We didn't see it yet, no. So it, uh, that's only potential. I don't believe Yogurt's original list did run it. Right, okay. But Tyler's list that he was playing today did run it. Okay. And I think that may be a change that happened since deck submission. Okay. Not 
completely sure on that. But regardless, Angoro Pack still is capable of doing a lot of work. And drawing it is not what they would have wanted yet. They don't need it right now. They've got a good enough hand that they don't want it. And this means they cannot get it from the Shadow Vision. So this is it. This is their one pack. And they still have a handful of leftover stuff from that Liver turn a couple of turns ago, which is hampering their ability to, to empty their hand and get the pack. Yeah, he only needs to use two more cards, right? He could play the Dirty Rat, I guess. But Purify replaces itself. Powered Shield replaces itself. Well, this is the problem sometimes with this deck. Uh, I think maybe just Dragonfire Potion. Oh, it doesn't kill the dragon. <laughs> you don't silence the minion type. Oh, Ashbringer going into a 1-1. One -one. Ouch. Yeah, especially when your opponent is okay, at 16. Works. Now he's going to pack. Let's see what they get from Still this. Still needs to play one more card this turn or he does mill something. Swamp King Dread. Primordial Glyph. Glyph. Wait, how good is Glyph and Priest, though? Priest could get him in mind control, though... That's only good with Medivh, really. Getting a second free from Amber would be okay. No, you'd further mind control because that becomes eight mana. That works. Just keep defending yourself, Kazakhstan. Yeah, and getting the other big minion into the deck is useful as well. There is the Shadow Visions. We'll be able to see soon what the remaining spells are. I doubt there are many. Then again, still 14 cards left. Now. Yeah, it feels like this game's gone a long way, but not actually that much has happened. Swamp King Dread sitting pretty in Jypotox's hand has a very odd interaction, a very new interaction. When your opponent plays a minion, it just attacks it. Um, it's, it's pretty simple, really. It does get frozen if it attacks a minion that would freeze it. Uh, it, it attacks Dirty Rat. If Dirty Rat pulls it out and yep. summons it, it then attacks the rat, which is very odd as well. Card is very good against combo decks. Something like Combo Priest, you mm. cannot get your combo off. You play your 4-8 yep. and Dread just kills it. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's a bit slow, it's a bit cumbersome. Don't see it in many decks. There was a week where like three teams played it in a row. Yeah. And I thought I'd nail the meta because I liked the card, but in general, it's there as a combo I have to killer. Admit, I like the card too. It's bad against Tyrion, though. It's pretty weak generally against Paladin, though the Tyrion's already gone. Sidonia probably runs a Stonehill Defender. He could easily get another Tyrion. Also, his board now is going to get out of control. He can put down a load of Murlocs next turn and then buff them all up with the Megasaur. They are in a position where they need to hurry along, though, Kazakhstan. Even though they seem to be getting the better of this slowly but surely, they are now facing down lethal. And so they are going to have to actually make sure they've got plenty of taunts. They're not dying anytime soon, let me clarify. But they are, every turn, going to have to be aware of the fact that lethal is going to be out there for a turn or two longer. Is this Glyph? Is this Glyph coming down this turn? Dirty rat. Going to try and get a decent Dragonfire Potion by the looks of it. Pulled out the Gentle Megasaur. That's going to prevent a lot of damage in the near future. Unfortunately, Dragonfire Potion isn't going to destroy the Primordial Drake. It's still a dragon. As you said, what, five minutes ago? You can't it's silence its dragoniness. Shadow Word Horror. And Pint Size Potion. Can't he take both of them? He wants to take both of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's really unfortunate. <laughs> I think that's irony, that right there. Uh, I think irony is what Raven does. <laughs> um, <laughs> Tell me a moment, but I got takes that. Takes the Dragonfire Potion anyway. It does clear up the rest of the board, of course. Goodbye, Radiant Elemental, I guess. Going to use the cheaper one so that he can heal as well. Yeah, that doesn't seem like it worked out that well. And Jibotox... He looked frustrated then, didn't he? I'm wondering if he missed the fact that the Drake was going to survive. I'm wondering that as well. He just, there was a kind of like, oh, done it. In that his, that in his thing face. that only bad players do. Oh my goodness, I've done that thing. Maybe I'm giving him not enough credit no, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I did get the impression that he, he was panicked into doing that and just forgot that the Drake, which is silent, so it is easy to make silly mistakes. We can't say it for certain, but I got a similar impression. I thought the same thing as you were saying it, so... So Consecration seems like a must here to me. You get to force through all this damage. Ten. And you get to use a Consecration for two as well. And then I think the question is, how many Murlocs do you want to play? Should... Uh, maybe just half of them. Just Hero Power, play Rockpool Hunter, play Merlot Wally, do The downside of the Consecration is that you've got it with equality at the moment. If a massive board gets built up, Mm -hmm. You cannot clear it. If you do it the slow way, you can. Okay, so slow is the safer way. 
here for Sidonia. But if you do it the slow way, I think you have to put more Murlocs on the board. If he does go all in here, though, that second Dragon Fire Potion is going to punish him. I think you keep back the War Leaders, and I think you keep them back so that so you want to play both they're one. just surprise damage next turn. This is nice. This puts lethal up, I think. Hey, look. Jabberdox also runs Harrison Jones. So... Tyrion's already gone. Is there a reason not to play it this turn? I guess the reason not to play it is because you want to spend your mana elsewhere. Yeah, you've got to be very careful you don't just die. I think there's still a Dragonfire Potion in the deck, but I'm not completely sure. If there is, then... There I, is. I'd be tempted to just... They pulled it with the right. Shadow Visions. In that case, I'd be <coughs> tempted... Right. And then you got the other one from a Primordial Glyph. Right. I'd be tempted to just play, play the Dragonfire Potion, grab another one. Or not even grab the other one this turn. You don't need to. If just you get rid of drawing. two minions. You can get rid of the two minions kind of by playing a curator. Yeah, that's true. Uh, of course, it doesn't deal with the Drake because we're all learning this game. <laughs> Your turn. As I was just pointing out myself five minutes ago. Okay, Potion Amanda seems like a good one here. Uh, but just not right now. Interesting, they're going to Harrison. They chose to Harrison after so they could get an extra version of something. Um, rather than drawing first and getting more information, they decided to try and get two of a kind. Mm -hmm. Just using this to kill one minion. And how okay. close are they well, to just having lethal here? What this does do, if Sidonia didn't have anything in his hand, is it would force the Harrison and the Drake to trade. But okay, Sidonia just picked up a lot of value there. And you're right, he's got a lot of damage here. So they've got... 12 damage available if you consecrate and play both war leaders and go all face. That's not enough, so he won't be doing that. Just pointing out it is getting very close. I think it's... I think it's yeah, it is, because he can't play the Rockpool Hunter as well, you're right. So he's going to play one of the war leaders. Uh, I think you might find then that he trades the Rockpool Hunter into the Harrison mm -hmm. to protect his Drake, which you can see that they're having trouble getting rid of. It's the old priest meme. It's a four attack minion that is a dragon. Oh, there you go. Pound in the jar. Something like that. Two I pounds. think it's legit. Two pounds, actually. You said dragon as well. But no, you're right. I I, I, I do think, of course, it's it's pretty funny meme at this point, but it is also worth saying, for those of you that don't know, like priests, as you're seeing firsthand, priests struggle to deal with this. Priest of the Feast, pretty good here. He can actually be played with dragon fire potion to clear up the majority of this board, and also develop a decent minion that will trade well with the Dragonfire Potion. I like it a lot. Will, of course, get no value from being a Priest of the Feast, but they've got one spell in hand anyway, and that doesn't really do the job very well. Uh, just purifying the ability anyway. Uh, I think it does you, get you the You gain heal. the three health once, but then, yeah. then that's the end of everything. I only know that interaction because of the embrace the, uh, the shadow interaction. Right. It's the same way. You get the heal, you don't take damage. So, putting down a big minion. Sidonia managing these limited resources very well this game. Um, he'll be hoping that this hits the dragon. It does it not. So that thing can actually die now. There's the Medivh, the inevitable Medivh the Guardian. Now, a quality consecration is still in Sidonia's hand. This game could be over. So Taunt required, but like you say, Quality Consecration will deal it. with that board. Taunt plus heal just isn't enough. Eight plus one is nine, which is the nine damage. So taking out the Drake and playing a Taunt is not enough. But you need to heal as well. Yeah, yeah. So the heal, if he purifies his um, Radiant yep. Elemental, well, actually, all the Priests of the Feast, yep. he gets enough of a heal to then survive through the Equality Consecration. He does, but he'll be in a bit of a spot. One health spare. Yeah. Equality Consecration War Leader actually will be the win, right? Oh, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. That's it. So is there anything else? And that's it. Equality Consecration will do two damage. The attack will be for nine, but if he plays the War Leader, it will buff up. Look at the smile as he realizes, oh, yeah, I've got a beast in my deck. So then he picks up the Vine Cleaver. We could talk about that, but it's just not relevant anymore. As you spotted, War Leader going to be that final little bit of damage needed. Sidonia finally going to take what ended up being a mammoth first game of the series for Team Canada. And if Denmark didn't lose the game in the last series, then Canada getting this win would have knocked them out anyway. Right, so Denmark probably feel a whole lot less 
awful about everything right now. Sidonia looking thrilled to have won that one. Um, a long, hard game, that, and very well managed. Yeah, incredibly well managed. Uh, I'm a little bit disappointed. I do enjoy watching this pre -stack. I've I always like watching pre -stacks. I think you've know, you've thought for a long time that Priest is one of my favorite classes right. to play. It turns out it's not one of the classes I have one of the most wins with, as I found out recently. When right. I got the, it's actually my second least win. That's because Priest games all take an hour. That, that's probably the reason, yeah. Uh, next up is going to be Purple versus Smerticotic. Purple on the Druid, Smerticotic on the Paladin. Again, Priest, one of these classes we haven't seen all that much of recently. No, I don't know. Um... We've seen one Jade Druid, I think, this week. Yeah, and like two um, Angry Druids as well. Angry Druids? With the Angry Birds that hit you for ah, 100 every single They're not turn. angry. They're cute and pink and cuddly and vicious. And they're vicious. They are vicious. Yeah. And they hit you really hard because they always get Wind Fury. <laughs> every time. Um, it's not statistically <coughs> true. It's, it's, not, it's not actually... Be interesting because Purple innovates a lot of stuff that he does. He plays innovate a he lot. Does play innovate a lot actually? Yeah, um, with Druid in particular. So, wouldn't necessarily big expect Druid. this to be big Druid. It's going to be big Druid. Sure, let's call it. I reckon Purple's going to play something a bit unusual. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see it be big Druid. Do you think it's possible? I do. I'm so excited. I'm like a kid in a candy shop right now. Purple is a combination of genius and flair and crazy, all mixed into one bubbly guy. Um, and sometimes they come out in different amounts, so um, interesting to see exactly what he's got for us. But I wouldn't be surprised at all if he's got a big druid for us. He actually started playing Hearthstone in 2013. Purple been around for a long time, a lot around on the scene a long time. He's been a big name for a long time, uh, and he started playing because, and in his exact words, uh, he started watching the Great Crypt. The Great Crypt. Just another player. Three. The Crypt is responsible. Crypt, you've got so much to answer for. What's his favorite color? Uh, orange? Sure. Damn it. Expected a slower response than that. Yep. Um, purple, obviously, favorite color orange. And it could well be, because they spent quite a lot of time together <laughs> back in the Archon days. Oh. Um, purple does a lot of coaching. He seems to be the mind behind a lot of people who do really well as yep. well. Uh, yep. On top of the fact that he's been very close himself to some massive tournaments. And he, again, if my notes are up to date, I believe he plays for Gamers Origin at the moment. French team. That sounds likely. I know he does a lot of French um, broadcasting. So moved across from English to French full time maybe 18 months ago. Mm. At a number pulled from somewhere but around this chair. certainly pulling his weight uh, for Team Canada here. It's not all about France for him. As uh, Come on, come on, big Druid. I just want to see the Druid now. If it's, if it's aggro druid, you can cast this one yourself, Neil. Really? Yeah. Cool. Sounds like fun. Let's see what we're going to get. Oh, it's Jade. It's Jade. So unfortunately, you don't get to cast this one yourself. Will there be any interesting pieces in here? Maybe an acolyte. And a pyromancer. And a pyromancer. There are things we might see. I'm still disappointed that it's not big druid. Uh, maybe it's big druid with one jade idol in for infinite <laughs> at the end. You've let me down, purple. You've let me down. Meanwhile, on the other side, this is a loot hoarder, which to me means uh, it's going to be Nazoth Paladin. Now, as I was saying earlier, the thing about Nazoth Paladin is that a lot of them... Uh, I've been playing RDU's list yep. over the last uh, day or so, and uh, the only death rattles he runs are Infested Tauren and yep. Tyrion. Yep. The idea being that you use getaway coders, redemptions, and Stonehill defenders to get more Tyrions. So he wasn't running Loot Hoarder, but it does make sense. So I'm going the other way. I don't think that many Nazoth Paladins necessarily run Loot Hoarder. Right. But what on earth do you play Loot right. Hoarder yeah. in unless it's Nazoth Paladin? Yep, I agree with you there. So Purple, while I was saying that, found something absolutely hilarious, and I'm not sure what. Um, everything. Purple just finds everything hilarious. There we go. There's the Innovate. And there's the Wild Growth. And that is a good old school Hearthstone hand. By old school, I mean back in the days of 14 Druid. 14 Druids. <laughs> yeah, all that's missing is the shade of Naxxramas. So this game will bumble along with very little happening until about turn 12, where suddenly the Paladin will have a whole load of big things and the Druid will be making bigger and bigger jades. Bumble along? <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> that's what it'll do. Let's bumble. Um, the Druid will... <laughs> Over to you, Dan. 
<laughs> I'm in the process of just destroying the druid, myself. The druid is going to want to go ahead and get these jades as big as possible, as fast as he right. possibly can. I don't mind passing turn one at all. Turn two, wild growth into turn three, jade spirit or Fandral. He can even save the innovate for something like a gadget and auctioneer later. Though now he's drawn the second jade spirit, he might be tempted to innovate out one and then coin out the other next turn. And at this point, you fancy that you're just going to win this already if you're the druid. Uh, dig all the way through your deck and get yourself to those gadget sands. Uh, get that deck size down to about four, and then just shuffle infinite jade idols in and draw three or four of them a turn. Make a 10, 10, 11, 11, 12, 12, 13, 13 on the same turn. Get it equality consecrated, and then just do it all again, but even bigger numbers than 13. And I've run out of fingers at that point, so. First jade spirit comes down. We've seen jade things get out. In fact, the one jade druid we saw yesterday, I think the jades were already 4-4 four, four by turn four. Right. So that was, that was completely insane. Uh, so not too much of a fierce board from Canada here, though it's going to get out of control sooner rather than later, I think. Just quite a simple turn here, I think. Just play the Jade Spirit. Later on, you've got Fandral in hand. Later on, if you draw a Nourish, you could maybe Fandral Innovate Nourish. Or, yeah, just save Innovate on the coin for the Gadget and Auctioneer that's going to come later. It's sometimes nice in these longer matches, as long as you've already got your early game, which Purple most certainly has, to Fandral and Jade Idol on the same turn. It's not what you normally want. You normally don't want those Jade Idols filling up your deck too early. But in, in this sort of long game, you can wait for that to be like an extra auctioneer later on. I was looking at, um, at Smurtz Kotick there at the bottom. I was wondering if he was taking a selfie now, following in the footsteps of a certain other player we had yesterday. He was waving his phone around. Yeah, selfie taking, fidget spinning. Oh, you. Globe is. spinning? Globe spinning. Ah, you can't really rhyme spinning with spinning. Never mind. I ruined it. Killed it. Can't rhyme. I'm so lost right now, Dan. I'm just going to continue watching this slow destruction of Smurto Kotick. Promodio Drake, pretty good pickup from the Stonehill Defender there. Even against big Jade Golems, it can defend for a, t a couple turns, or you can combo it with a quality. You've now got a quality consecration and a quality Drake. Sunky Vitarium, also pretty good at dealing with Jade Golems. I think purple will be tempted. So the thing you've got to work out now as Canada is when do we play this auctioneer? Mm -hmm. Now, one of your instincts is just now is fine. We can coin out earthen scales, take down the 1-4. Yep. We've already seen one true silver. It should be good. The other instinct was, well, we don't really care. We're in no hurry. We don't need to do it this turn. We could have waited one turn. I don't know. Purple's in a pretty big hurry here by the looks of things. He's going to pick up the Wrath as well. He's now able to clean up the 1-1 one, one and the Stonehill Defender, meaning a quality on its own isn't going to be good enough to deal right. with the Skadjistan Auctioneer. In fact, uh, Kazakhstan would have to use up a quality and Consecration. I'm not even sure that's worth it. Or quality Pyromancer just I mean, as bad. if you don't, you lose. So it's worth it. But if you do, you can't clear a massive board of Jade Golems later on. I think you're right. I think he has to do it. But I definitely don't think Kazakhstan are going to feel good about it. Yeah, they're definitely not going to enjoy it. Uh, they'll probably look at the tower and see if there's something they can do there. Uh, but I think they just have to do it. You see the damage the auctioneer did there, those deck sizes on the right-hand side, down to 16 cards already. As soon as you get that number down to about 8 or 7, you are effectively infinite. The auctioneers will then just pick out the, the odd bits and pieces from the deck and purify it. No, it's not a priest before you ask, um, by putting all the Jade Idols back in. There is a way that Kazakhstan can deal with this board without playing the equality. Okay. And that is Pyromancer, Consecration, Forbidden Healing. And that might be worth considering because he got the extra Primordial Drake right. from the Stonehill Defender. It means he's he's still going to have more ways of comboing the I equality like it. later. So that is a potential way of dealing with this nasty situation without wasting... Yeah, I want to say you one of the sitting on the board as well. That's what they're going to go with, I think. No, nope. no, nope. nope. going to still go with the equality. But it was just, it was worth considering that, I think. It definitely was. And this is now where the Jade Druid is weird because it has this awkward turn or two where all it does is makes massive monsters. <laughs> but those massive monsters aren't winning you the game. They're just buying you the time until you get to the auctioneer that wins you the game. You don't need to know -ish. You just sit there, play your Jade Blossom, play your Jade Spirit, put stuff on the board, and all the time those are just distracting the opponent. You know, these monsters are pretty fine. I'd say that was an okay turn seven. Second like loot order. Hmm. I mean, there must be an Azoth in this deck. You're absolutely right, but... 
And it's in his office, doesn't mind fatigue him, fatiguing himself. I don't think Legal Horde is that bad, I must admit. Um, a lot of these decks do very little of use on turn two anyway, so why not draw into make sure your turns three, four, five are much more pure? Uh, the fact when it comes back from the Zoth, it's okay, uh, especially in a tight mirror match, for instance, <laughs> then, you know, don't worry about that too much. Just a way of cycling through. Uh, I found Loot Hoarder is actually okay in Tempo Mage as well sometimes. Sure. Another, another deck that just runs out of cards. Pretty good in Freeze Mage too. <laughs> Turns out it's pretty good in Freeze Mage too. Smurtikotic. Trying to work out where he's going to put this 1-1. One, one. Going to put it into the 3-3. Three, three. Setting up for a potential Primordial Drake next turn. Yep. All right. Yeah, and Fandral is just going to do silly things now. The whole hand is just full of green leaves. Uh, okay. Opting not to play the Nourish. Yeah, uh, sometimes you save the Nourish so that you can draw yep. three idols in one turn at the end of the game. Makes sense. Here we uh, go. It's like acts like another auctioneer in that regard. Yeah, yeah. But let the shuffling begin now. <laughs> Several Jades, a further uh, six. Jade Golem's been shuffled into the deck. You absolutely do um, not want to equality consecrate this. Primordial Drake isn't that good either. Well, he doesn't want to. Looks like he's going to have to. Right, and that makes things so dangerous now because these things don't get smaller, they get bigger, as you are well aware. It's both the quality's gone. Yeah, exactly. So I keep a terrain sort of acts like a right. quality. And maybe another Pyromancer with a consecration with Terim uh, or with Primordial Drake might act like another kind of one. Nah. <laughs> That's not going to be dealing with nine or ten health minions. Yeah, the whole thing is just going to get messy. Uh, considering the nourish there, it's just going to yep. draw him probably a Jade Idol or two. Then again, there are still a lot of other cards in his deck. There is one. There's the Auctioneer. Okay, so now he just needs to kill a little bit of time, very little amount of time, until he wants to Auctioneer, maybe even next turn. Um, hmm. Would he have played that if he was planning on playing the Auctioneer next possibly. turn? Possibly. Yeah, I guess. It's still I mean, a huge Sorry, possibly board. he would have saved it. Yeah, but it's a huge board, like you say. Out of Peacekeeper plus Stampeding Coda, we'll deal with one Jade Golem. Do you think the time for that is now, or is he going to have to wait a little bit longer? Wait until maybe there's only one coming a turn on the board. I'm not comfortable with the fact that he used both equalities <laughs> anyway. Right. And so... I'm not comfortable with this. Because now, <coughs> when Purple next has a big wave of Jade Golems, Smurtikotic's not going to be able to do anything about it. Yeah, Smurtikotic's not been in a good position for most of this game. Let's face it, Purple just went off to a double Jade Spirit start, got a hefty Auctioneer turn on turn five or six, and everything's been pretty crazy ever since. But now Purple is just abusing that fact. He is just going to make huge Jade minions, like we keep saying, but he's got a license to do it however he likes. So... I guess it's the Gadget's Gun watching your turn now. Not yeah. sure if there's any reason to hold on to it. I guess you could wait until you draw the second Wild Growth. That would be a reason to hold on to it. I think you Gadget's Gun, then you may... I would Earthen Scales here, by the way. Yeah? I don't think you care too much about the armor. You might as well Earthen Scales. Because no. uh, if you don't, then, then you've got to decide whether you want to shuffle or not. Well, he decided not, he decided not to. He's still got several Jade Idols left in his deck. I don't think I mind this too much, though... You're right, Purple's not at any risk of losing whatsoever. So, just getting the most out of his cards. Think, like, Purple knows that Kazakhstan's used all of their equalities. He knows that right. tarim has gone. Unless another tarim came from that Stonehill Defender earlier, we can see it's a Primordial Drake, but that's the one thing that Purple's going to be considering. Looks like he's going to Feral Rage, no? Hang on. <coughs> Excuse me. Um. Huggly Bully. There you go, there's the flare. You said Purple was probably going to have a little bit of flare in his deck. Burgly Bully going to be that card. And it's very strong with Gadget's and Auctioneer. The card makes sense. Peacekeeper Kodo, a way of dealing with one massive minion, but there's more where that came from. Yeah, he can deal with the Gadget's and Auctioneer as well, which is very helpful. In fact, Purple doesn't have any Jade cards in his, in his hand whatsoever. It looks like we may have a situation here where he can only play one Jade Golem a turn. So Kazakhstan does have time. <coughs> Yet one Noish has gone to... Uh, both auctioneers have gone, so there's not going to be a rapid sort of influx of jades. But Smurtikotic is 
Not played a minion of note apart from the two loot hoarders to go with Nazoth. If there is Nazoth, we're assuming there is. And Purple still has plenty of options available. There's Jade Idol. I think we can expect most of Purple's draws now to be Jade Idols. Well, actually, he's only shuffled, what, six into his deck? And mm. he's drawn at least two or three. He's them. drawn a good few of those, yeah. So, despite the fact I'm saying, yeah, almost every turn he'll draw on, it's actually quite a low percentage. I don't think he's drawn a Jade Behemoth yet. And that's actually going to be a very valuable card now at this stage in the game. Yeah, there's two of those left in there. And like you say, that'll be very valuable. Just a taunt minion that protects your big, monstrous Jade. Pretty handy, it turns out. Purple having to decide whether he even wants to play this Jade Idol here. I don't think there's really any reason not to. You're just trying to trying to just wear out Kazakhstan's resources, get rid of their removal bit by bit. Going to play the Drake and the Jade Idol. It seems good to me. Yeah, he's just going to make it. Um, again, that's, that's like a do-it-yourself Jade Behemoth, just hide <laughs> yeah. behind the taunt. Slightly better stats, but yeah, you're right. Curator. So... Smurtacotic hasn't drawn a Primordial Drake yet. He probably has right. one. So there's that. Uh, Beasts, I doubt he runs Gentle Megasaur. We've barely seen any Murlocs in this deck. So, and, and we've seen Stampeding Kodo. A lot of these Nazoth Paladins are only running, running one. Right. So I say he's unlikely to get a Beast. Have we seen two Hydrologists or just one? I think we've only seen one. I think we've only seen one, but I wouldn't swear to it anymore. So, Creator could possibly draw. It's likely to draw one Drake and possibly one Hydrologist. Right. If he's only drawn one. That's what we're going to see from that. None of these cards are going to win him the game, though. And he is in a tough spot. The Peacekeeper will buy some time. The Primordial Drake will buy some time. The Curator is probably just the best bet because then he can play that alongside the Peacekeeper and try and do 38 damage before Purple draws a 10-10. Doesn't seem like a very favorable proposition. 38 damage going to become 46 when Purple plays that Feral Rage. Drake actually going to do a pretty good job of clearing out most of this board. Seems fine. Jade Golem, in theory, will have to trade with both of these minions, though, as we can see, there are two swipes there. Purple picking up a completely dead Innovate. Now tempting is just a double swipe here, but yeah, get away, Kodo. Putting the Primordial Drake back into hand, as that's what the card text says it does. Double swipe, Innovate, Feral Rage could have been an option at some point in this game, just for a 12 damage burst. Not quite 14 Druid, but 12 is still a big 12 number. 12 is plenty. 9-3 is actually quite difficult to deal with at this point. Mm. Again, the pace keeper will deal with it, but again, we keep making the same hey, point. that deals with the 9-3. Kind of. And I think you have to do it. You have to accept your face tanking this yeah, damage. I think you're right. And you have to outdoor something that comes bigger later. So Kazakhstan doing the second best Second Kodo, second Drake. Okay, second Kodo, and there's the second Hydrologist. Okay. I wasn't expecting him to be running a second Kodo. I don't... No, if he runs Nazoth at this stage. Yeah, I've started to wonder myself. We haven't seen any of the other Nazoth stuff, so. Oh, that's a game winning card if I ever did see one. <laughs> Summon a 10 10 Jade Golem. When you die, summon an 11 11 Jade Golem. What could go wrong with such a plan? And not much, I don't think, here. But yeah, it looks like it is not Nazoth. It's just like those loot hoarders are in there to. Yeah to fuel the deck to get to your good stuff quicker. Looks like it's just an anti-aggro paladin to me. Yeah, I mean, two ones do quite well against pirates. They kill pretty much every turn one play, at least. Innovating out, swipe. Woo, killing a turn one play with a two drop, but yeah. <laughs> and fishing through your deck. But purple on the offensive here, he's like, right, game's going to end very, very soon. The... Uh, Adult Peacekeeper, Kodo combo isn't going to do all that much for Smurtacotic here. He could play Stonehill Defender as well. I think that does buy him one more turn. But every single turn now, whatever Golem is played by Purple will be threatening lethal. He can't even play Adult Peacekeeper. What am I talking about? He can't play Adult Peacekeeper and Kodo and Stonehill Defender. That is actually 11 mana. Chat lethal. But so that's the end of that 10-10. And that's the end of the game. Even if there was no swipe, Hero Power would do the job from Purple. Smurtacotic gives the well played, and he doesn't look too happy with himself. No, he's in the not like this position almost there. And 2 0 to Canada, making this look easy so far today. Even though it's taking a while for the games, 
they are putting on a bit of a clinic in terms of actually winning them. Have to admit, do agree with what you were saying earlier about the uh, about Smurtikota using all of his qualities very right. early. I do think he should have maybe tried to save one and not use it on the Gadgetson Auctioneer. Yep. The Pyromancer Consecration would have dealt three damage, Spin Healing would have dealt the fourth. That was one way of dealing with it. Maybe with two more consecrations or even one more consecration later on in the game, he'd be able to get that one more board clear necessary to survive and win the game. I don't know. It looks to me like he may have had a chance there. If those conditions had been met, they hadn't. Not to worry about it too much, Kazakhstan. They're going to have to just move on to the next game and try and reset. Yeah, it is really hard with that matchup. The longer you can use your equality or hold it, sorry, for the more damage it does. And yep. they did use them up very early. Rogue versus Rogue, Hot Bomb versus Hallmark. The Battle of the H's, the Battle of the Rogues. Huh. I'm surprised that they both picked Rogue, honestly, because you'd think that the Shaman deck, if it's Evolved Shaman, would be favored against Rogue because it's quite mm -hmm. fast, it goes quite wide. And given that you had the potential of queuing up your Evolved Shaman against a Rogue, I would have thought both players would have picked the, sh the, uh, the Shaman here. That's interesting to me. I wonder what the two shamans actually well, were. Well, that's the thing. If it wasn't <laughs> Evolved Shaman, then this makes a lot more sense. Right. It's quite funny if both of these weren't Evolved Shaman, though. Like, given that all week, all we've seen is Evolved Shaman. I don't know. Also it's depends on what the rogue is. It could deal with, if sure. it's Miracle, it can deal a little bit better with the Evolved Shaman. Fan of Knives, Blood Mage, Thanos, stuff, that case, backstabs. That's a hint that this could be a Miracle Rogue Mirror. Which is something we haven't said for about 12 months. Yeah, I don't remember the last time I watched a Miracle Rogue winner. Uh, mirror. Winner? I mean, mirror. Last time I was casting <laughs> Miracle Rogue Freudian mirrors, the whole thing was one team gets behind, or one player gets behind, and they would have to stealth up like a big <laughs> minion and hope to join to lethal the next turn in, in response to not dying. And that's not how it works anymore. No, I think actually how it works, a large part of it, if it is a Miracle Rogue Mirror, comes down to the first player to put Sherizan on the board. Because right. that is just five recurring damage that you can get and trade with every single turn. Uh, whereas, and you know, like recurring resources, they, they do yeah, that Yeah, it bit. sucks up three points of recurring resource as well as the right, five right, damage. Right, right, so. your opponent has to kill it each turn. Well, as many turns as possible. That's just interesting. I thought it was just worth pointing out. No, definitely. In my opinion, Shaman is the pick if you're playing like Quest Rogue. If, you're if you expect a Quest Rogue and if you're playing Evolve Shaman, which is the standard at the moment. Yeah, it's hard to know. It's a shame sometimes we don't get to see what the other deck yeah, was afterwards. Yeah. Um, so we never really get to find out. But yeah, that does make a lot of sense to me. So, Miracle Rogue, we've talked about it quite a lot. Let's see if it is. One is. One is. It is from Hot Form. It is not from Hallmark. So, who wins this matchup then? It's a totally different thing entirely. I think that common opinion is that the Quest Rogue wins it. Right. Personally, I think the Miracle Rogue's got a very good shot as it tends to be able to get to its win condition faster. If it can pick up a, a big Edwin nice and early, and if there's no Vanish in Kazakhstan's hand, then uh, the Miracle Rogue just has a the potential to deal the damage it needs to quickly. As Kazakhstan, as, as, as the Quest Rogue, they can't really win the game until the quest's been completed. Yeah, <laughs> very difficult. I have seen like one game in all of Hearthstone Global Games where actually the opposition conceded before the quest was completed, <laughs> just threw beat down from two attack and one I attack. I think I Indians. remember that one. It was like just one of those games where the other team just drew nothing. They, they, the one side just looked at each other like, yeah, we could just hit you for three every turn. It's going <laughs> to do it. Uh, especially with the threat of the quest behind, of course. Not the uh, hottest hand for a hot No, he's definitely there. out of form with these cards. But picking up an Edwin Van Cleef could change this hand significantly from the hallucination he's going to choose between Sap, Lotus, Assassin, and Deadly Fork. Deadly Fork. Not the I'm surprised that Lotus Assassin hasn't seen more play, but it's not good in this matchup. It's not the hottest selection whatsoever, because Sap actually allows Hallmark to get closer towards yeah. his quest completion, unless it's saved until after the quest is complete. Is it really the time of your life when you have to pick a Deadly Fork? Uh, he's <laughs> Hot Form's laughing about it. There, yeah. Oh, he's picked it! <laughs> this is a first. This is definitely a first. Right. Kazakhstan doing the obvious. Could have divided to develop the Firefly first. No need against a Miracle. No need at all. It's not going to go anywhere. Two Vastbind Slayer. 
the frustrating thing about Vast Bunch Slayer is that it's just dealing with with one five five, and then the, the quest rogue plays a bunch more. It doesn't have a good body either. It's just a three four. So the next five five trades very nicely into it. And I'm just looking at Hot Form's face, realizing that next turn he has to play Deadly Fork. It's just not ideal, man. Hot Form. <laughs> <laughs> Daggers up, hits face this turn. Next turn, I guess he'll hit the face again and put the Deadly Fork down. For those of you that don't know, when Deadly Fork dies, this, this card came out in One Night at Karazhan. It's been around for a while, but it's never seen any play. It's a three mana, three, two. When it dies, it puts a three mana Fiery War Axe in your hand. Oh, three, uh, another th a three mana, three, two weapon. In your hand, by the way, guys. Which is why it sees no play, because tempo-wise, this card is miserable. Yeah, when people saw it in card reviews, they're like, oh, this is really good, because everybody assumed that the weapon was equipped. Right, and that would be great. Nobody actually read the card. That would, be, like, yeah. that would be so good. It would have been such a great card. And actually, in the sort of metas we see today, it's a card I wouldn't su be surprised if it actually turned up, like just mini Tyrion. <laughs> yeah. But at the time, we read that and thought, a lot of people thought, well, that's going to go into play. No, nope, it's just garbage. There's the Arcane Giant. Hotform's going to want to start picking up some spells as soon as possible. And actually, Kazakhstan's not going to be able to deal with this. That's quite funny. It is, oh. but it's not going to do a whole bunch of damage. Now they can. They can, but will they want to pull Patches out of their hand? Patch is much better coming out of your hand when it is a 5-5 than when it's out of the deck. So it's even better from the one. deck, yeah. It's, it's okay from the yeah. hand, but it's great from the deck. A lot of people will choose to just wait here and suck up some damage for a turn or two. Actually, two fireflies in the hand is pretty huge for Hallmark there. He's going to be completing that quest very quickly. You just shadow step one of them back. He yeah, needs to make sure one of these cards ends up back in his hand just because Blood Mage Thanos into Prep Fan would clear everything and ruin his day. Yep. And he is going to do it with Fireflies, not with Flame Elementals, by the look of it. Still has the option, of course. But well, it's going <coughs> to... Should be just as fast, unless he picks up an Igneous right. Elemental. And uh, it's just a lot more resources added to the hand that way. Yeah, you've got to be careful not to burn the quest, as many people have done now. Always amusing to watch. Yep, way back when, in week one of the Hearthstone Global Games. And even now, it still happens. We've seen Shana Dutchie do it. We've seen yep. all sorts of people do it. So, Canada's mission here is twofold. They can't do anything about stopping the quest getting completed. That, as far as they're concerned, is happening next turn. It's not. There's yep. another bounce required. Um, what they can do is every time they kill a minion, they're killing a 5-5, five five, but then they're not doing any damage to the face. So they need to balance all of this up and try somehow to come out with an equation that results in Kazakhstan taking 28 points of damage. I just noticed the apples floating behind the deadly fork. That's very entertaining. All well, the different fruits, there's a pear there. I don't think I've ever seen this card in gold before. See that? Wow, Dan is now pointing out the flying fruit. I'm not even sure what I'm supposed to think well, about it. Well, you're never going to see this card in golden again because because it's a One Night Karazhan card, you actually have to craft it in gold. Right. You can't pull it from a pack, so. There we go, so check that out in your crafting screen. You'll see a lot of fruit flying around. <laughs> sharp fork. A sharp fork. This is amusing you greatly, <laughs> isn't it? It's just such a silly card. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> Very much the um, spirit of Hearthstone there. Yeah, um, must admit, even though I've got a bit of a small of a smile on my face at this <laughs> point. Fastbow Slayer taking out a two mana one one. Not exactly what the card was made for, but sure, why not? Put something on the board for hot form. Yeah. He's, he's in this unfortunate position where he's barely drawn any spells or any playable spells. He wants to get the cost of that arcane giant down. And he has to just treat it like he's killing a five five. Um, even though he's not, that's the equivalent of what's going to happen because this is now yeah. the quest complete. Time's up. Uh, let's do this. But no, Leroy. Leroy's not very good in Crestor. Look, because they kept that South Sea deck hand in their hand earlier, then next turn they will be able to pull a 5-5 five, five patches, not a 1-1 one, one patches out of oh, their deck. Oh, this turn. They can do it this turn. You can sure. coin it out. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> so by by choosing to let the fork hang around for turn or two, this, this play is now possible. They could have killed the fork quicker, more quickly as well. Oh. And now 
a whole bunch of stuff. No need to hit the face. You're not going to hit face three times, most likely. And you might want to keep that one point to kill a minion, which will be more efficient than trying to hit the face. <laughs> oh, man. Hotform didn't look best pleased there. Eight damage with two Eviscerate. Sharp Fork is a potential extra three. Vastvine is another three. That's actually a lot of damage. It's 14 damage that he can that he can deal this turn. Prep, Avis, Avis, Sharp Fork, go face. Hmm. But then you just die to the 20 damage that you're staring down at the moment. Doesn't seem ideal, Dan. Doesn't seem ideal. So let's see. He survives if he gets rid of just one of these minions. So... Oh, he's going to actually Avis a minion. I was thinking he could still Avis the face, but play Valspine to get rid of a minion. Prep. Yeah, oh, he's, he's having a bit of a laugh twice. about this as well, so... Oh, dear. So much wasted damage here. Having to be done just to stay alive. Does force down the giant, but I'm not quite sure how they win the game from here. <laughs> Hotform can't even play the Sharp Fork and the Valspine Slayer next turn. That fork is just too expensive. <laughs> Stone Tusk Boar is going to put us out of our misery. We won't have to talk about forks ever again, thank goodness. That was definitely a miserable game for Hot Four. I'm not feeling too good about that. It all fell into place for Hallmark, who's going to take the first game for Kazakhstan this series, game number three. 2-1, though, still to Canada. If they win this, they are going to win the group. And nothing so far has suggested they won't win this. Uh, that particular matchup just not playing out well. Opening hand of double preparation and then hallucinating a fork. I feel like I've been hallucinating for most of that particular game. I think if uh, if Canada if Canada win this series, yeah, of course they win the group as we've been saying. If they lose this series, are they second or third? Depends, and I can't remember what it depends on. If I'm perfectly honest, so um, I think there might be there still will be tiebreakers and stuff available. Yeah. All right, well let's see. Next game is going to be APX Void versus Neyman. Man of the hour, the man of Team Kazakhstan. He's also the ace player, so the fate of this country's shoulders. The fate of this wait, country's wait, right. shoulders. Rely on him? No? Hang <laughs> on a second. Rewind. The fate of this country. Rely on Neyman's shoulders. There we go. Second time got there. Nice work, Dan. Thank you. Nice work. And can they make it happen? Will they go 1-4 or will they be forever the nation that next season votes Borat actually onto the team? <laughs> Let's find out if Naaman can defend the honour of his country with his shoulders somehow. Can I just can I just cast with Neil the Murloc instead? Sure. I just, just pop him there. Yeah, I can do this. So Neil the Murloc, Naaman or APX Void? Who do you think is going to take this game? <laughs> <laughs> this is just too much today. <laughs> okay, so I think um, Hunter versus Druid. Depends what we're going to see. It does. Uh, Apex Void is the master of tempo in general, though. So Hunter, I suspect he'll be playing a pretty rapid version of the deck. Okay. Naaman on the other side. Jade Druid or Token Druid or Big Druid. I'm adding that into the mix. I know it won't be Big Druid. I don't think Naaman is the type of player to bring Big Druid. Yeah, it depends exactly what sort of mood he's in, but I think Naaman's pretty well, serious for the large part, so he'll bring a serious, normal-looking deck. Depends what mood he was in when he had to submit the deck list, you mean? Doesn't, sure. Doesn't really matter what mood he's in now. Like, he's stuck with whatever deck this is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I suspect he submitted sensible decks, though. Uh, definitely wants to win this as much as possible. Good that he gave his teammates one final view as well, knowing they're not going to be seen again. So all three of those guys, I'm sure it won't be coincidence. Name is saying, you guys get yourself on air one more time. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Name is going to have a lot of screen time ahead of him. The others may not have so much. Good guy, Naaman. Anyways, oh my goodness. It's going to be the big druid. It's going to be the big druid, Neil. It is indeed. Sorry if I just burst your Naaman is going to show the world his giant anaconda, <laughs> and he has got it in his hand right now. <laughs> oh APX Void, however, getting that fast start that we were expecting. That's uh, Stampeding Kodo is also a nod to the fact that he likes his tempo cards. It's a shame because it doesn't look like this game is going to go on for very long, but I'm so happy that we get to see Big Druid this week. Thank you, Naaman. Thank okay. you, Naaman. Wild Growth should 
be pretty useful in this deck, you would imagine. Yep, keeping both of those, throwing out the Anaconda, getting a Wrath as well, going to be huge, removing the board just to live a little bit longer. So Big Druid runs, as we've just seen, Giant Anaconda, it runs Ancient of War, it runs Ysera, it runs basically all of the big cards you can think of, Yasiraj being a, a big one, Deathwing and Deathwing Dragon Lord, I think. Both Deathwings. You've played this deck way too much, or at least watched it way too much. I played it a little bit last week. It's one of the reasons I was hoping that uh, that it would come up today. I played it probably for one day. Apex Void, though, his hand is going to develop incredibly quickly on this board. Uh, of course, he will have no idea what he is facing at this time. Uh, so after he sees the turn two wild growth, he will be assuming that it is Jade Druid. Yeah, he really does have no idea what he's about to face. Uh, yeah, so apparently, there you go, I'm going to port on another card. Apparently, this deck's been around for a little while. Right. But I only, like, discovered it the other day. I can't remember where I discovered it from. I think, I think actually Gaskin pointed it out to me. So right. Me, hey, Dan, have you tried Big Druid? I said, what's Big Druid? And then everyone I talked to that day about uh, Big Druid with, they all already knew what it was. So somehow I was oblivious to this deck for quite a while. Back in the first few weeks of the Hearthstone Global right. Games, there were a few Rampy Anaconda Druids. I just didn't know that there had been recent developments, as there had been with those Kaka and Zixo both playing it at quite a high rate. Yeah, I'm not even sure that the deck changed that much <laughs> right. in that time. It just reappeared. Um, the original version did have pretty much everything you just said in it. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, people just started playing it again. And presumably, I guess it's just as consistent against the control decks, but a little bit quicker. I don't know. No quest, though, sadly. Uh, because of that poisonous, Naaman's going to have to get rid of this uh, kindly grandmother. I expect wild growth plus hero power is going to be the way he goes about doing this. I don't see the point of wrathing it, but he needs to get rid of it so that next turn he can curve into the dark Arakoa. Yeah, he definitely needs to wrath. Uh, sorry, needs to wild growth. He can just wrath the 3 2 and take 1 damage as well. Yeah, but the problem with that is that next turn, if he plays the dark Arakoa, the poisonous on the kindly sure. grandmother just kills it. Yep, sure. So in that case, you just hero power it down. Uh, double Moonglade in hand. You're not dying anytime soon. So that being not? said, I don't think this game's going to last too long. If if Apex Void is able to get some, get that hyena buffed up a little bit, Naaman's going to really struggle to deal with it. There's not much removal in these Druid decks at all anymore. Swipe, Wrath. That's about as high as it gets, but there's no hard removal. So once that hyena gets so big, it's going to be a huge problem for Naaman. It is, but there's going to be some giant taunts in the way of it as well. So maybe they can head it off that way, just like huge minion after huge minion kill you in two turns. Yep, so Naaman gets to six mana on a turn of four. That's fair. Seems fair to me. And now it's over to APX Void to deliver damage as quickly and yeah. efficiently as he can. The Dark Arakoa is pretty pretty obvious for Naaman next turn, especially if the, if the Scavenging Hyena remains in APX Void's hand. But then APX Void can just trade everything into it whilst buffing the Hyena. That looks like a pretty good draw for APX Void now, filling out his curve and setting up yep. for a great Hyena coming up. Uh, did Naaman keep both Wild Growth in the opening hand? He did. He did. So Canada know what they're up against then? Because right. you wouldn't keep both against uh, with Jade Druid. Okay. You want to get some sort of board, so keeping two wild growth would be a mistake. So yeah, Canada do know what they're playing against. Well, they definitely do now. If if they didn't, right. You're right. They probably did before. Apex Void giving a little bit of a smile and a nod there. <coughs> I think this play is quite straightforward. Just drop the hyena, trade everything into that Arako and buff it up a bunch. Giant Anaconda, a card that you may not have seen since Ungaro came out. Very weak stats for its mana cost, but when it dies, put it like Void Caller, it pulls out a huge minion from your hand. It can pull out Deathwing Dragon Lord, Yashiraj, whatever you want, really. Well, not whatever you want, you don't get to choose, but whatever you've drawn at that point. Yeah, you can manipulate your hand, so you do pull out whatever you want. That being the point, a Primordial Drake is like the worst thing to get there. It means that the Anaconda is just not playable. Yeah, Kazakhstan can bluff this Anaconda if they want. They can play it and hope that Canada are not willing to trade into it. If, if he does play it, and it does get traded into, then Naaman's going to be very disappointed. If he plays it, he might be dead. That's right. the other thing he's got to worry about here. He might just actually die. Madam Goya, not the six drop they're looking for. Not the for. best six drop. It's not a 1-1, one, one, but it's not the best six drop. And this is going to just be a smacking. Uh, the Eagle Horn Bow takes care of her pretty well whilst allowing you to force through another 10 damage. There you go with Madam Goya. Thank you. 
relevant thing here is that it's a 4-3. It's Battle Cry, obviously, not going to be taken into effect this game. No, Madam Goya, sort of the card that you may consider playing in this sort of deck. There yeah, was I mean, it's a card that I think we'll see play at some point. There was the a Madam Goya Shaman at one point, wasn't there? Was there? Yeah, I think so. I think it was Shaman. It's a card that's going to see play at some point. I, I just There's too many weird cards that do that sort it of was, thing. It was. It was Madam Goya. It was like Earth Elementals, that, that type of thing. Okay. That sounds terrifying. The dream being you play Barnes and then swap the minion out with sure. Madam Goya for a... Uh, yeah, that's definitely something that we'll see play eventually. I'm I'm really sure of it. But then people are not notoriously good at predicting what they think we'll see play in the end. So that's right. the person that predicted a Volt Shaman. Sure. I got one right eventually. Primordial Another Drake. Primordial Drake. Oh, my goodness. Well, it looks like he has to play one this turn. It does buff up the Hyena further. But as long as the Hunter doesn't have something like a Deadly Shot, at least the Hyena would have to trade next turn. Yeah, and slowly but surely getting through this, the Wrath of the extra Drake. Moonglade Portal, if Naaman played that, he would still be alive. Just. Uh, okay. But there's so many outs for APX Void. Yeah. Naaman may even think he already has them, so... A Kill Command would kill him if he played Moonglade Portal. In fact, a Kill Command would kill him if he played Primordial Drake. So, there's no playing around Kill Command. <laughs> because if you play the Drake, yep. then Kindy Grandmother would turn into the Big Bad Wolf. Kill Command would deal 5 damage. Big Bad Wolf would do the rest of the damage. Hyena would smack the face for 14. Uh, no, 16 even. Does not seem very fair. Naaman does not seem at all impressed. And this is exactly what I said earlier. Like, Druids don't have any hard removal for huge minions like this anymore. There's no mulch. And so it's like the case of using a swipe and a wrath now if you wanted to get rid of it. It's just not possible. Drake's going to come down. It's his only potential out, but he's just now hoping there's no kill command. There is, there a, kill is command. a kill command, and he knows it. Already done the maths. Doesn't really need to have thought about it very hard, actually. In it goes. Canada take down the win. 3-1. Take down the group and put themselves into a very good seeding position ready for phase two, which starts next week. Yeah, phase two. Canada going to be particularly looking forward to that, as you say, winning the group. Means that they're going to be matched against... Uh, the people that did, did a little bit worse right. in phase one, they're going to be ranked up against those that just uh, snuck through in third place, mostly. Yep, groups of four, so there'll be another decent team in there with them, but they'll probably get two not-so-decent teams yeah. in terms of how they did in phase one. I mean, there, there are some decent teams who didn't do so great, yeah. so it's not quite as simple as that. Well, there you go. Three wins to one loss for Canada as they continue their dominating streak in the Hustling Global Games. Don't forget the first couple of series as Canada played, they just won 3-0. and So not quite continued that with Hotform taking a loss here, but still great performance on their end. Not much more to add to that. Kazakhstan ending the Hearthstone Global Games as the only team to not win a game. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and five and next season will be all about Borat. But we've got Purple to talk to us. This is always an interesting time. Let's see what Purple's got to say today. Hey, Purple, how's it going? I'm well, how are you? Yeah, pretty good, thanks. Congratulations for winning the series and therefore winning your group in the Hearthstone Global Games. Um, before we go any further, I just want to quickly ask about that last game you played. At what point did you guys realize that it was a big druid that you were against? Oh, we knew it going into the match. We actually all called big druid. And we are just like, what? What matchup are we more comfortable playing against Big Druid? Because Big Druid is the nuts. Okay, and um, what, what made you think that it was a Big Druid? Because they're 0 and 4, and <laughs> their <laughs> other deck was Pirate Wars, so you might as well go out with Big Druid. Okay. Yeah, makes sense to me. Talk about going out, obviously you guys winning your group. Um, how um, You've worked with a lot of top players around the world in different events. How does this compare working with these three guys? Um... I mean, Cydonia basically does all the work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, very nice of you to admit. Yeah, we'll just say it as it is. It's like Cydonia preps us, and we briefly talk about our lineups every week. But basically, like, we were basically through after we were 3-0, so we just didn't want to change too much. So we don't give up, give away any information as to what's going on in the next round and stuff like that. Like, no big deal. Just some, playing the same stuff over and over again. So, do you think you will be changing anything as you go into the next series, changing the way you prep, um, working on, on communication anymore, or do you guys think that you've got it all sorted? Oh, we definitely don't have the optimal lineup. There's 
stuff that can be done. Will we change anything? Maybe. It's for the other teams to guess, right? Fair enough. Obviously, a man not wanting to reveal too much. And I don't blame you either. Uh, well, congratulations, Purple. We'll let you go at that point and see much more of you in the coming weeks, I'm sure. Thank you very much. I really like his attitude there. Just like, he was kind of giving us some information, but also not wanting yeah. to spill too much. Canada, clearly a team that want to win the whole thing. Yeah, as I've said before, Purple, a man who sits behind the scenes a lot. I know he's crediting side only with doing all the work here, but he knows better than anyone not to give things away. And he was not in the mood to give anything away today either. <laughs> we see Jai Patox, is he... We didn't see the reaction there with the Primordial Drake, unfortunately, but there was at the time a little bit of a... Like a little bit of a grunt, like, oh, yeah. oh dear. Rip. Yeah, rip. Good, good words. As we see, Sidonia eventually, this was a mammoth of a first game, but Sidonia took it away. And it looked like he was pretty favored all of the way through. Like the, the priest spent the entire game sort of clawing at what he could. And despite Purple saying that it's the nuts, the big druid, didn't bring it himself yet again. Just talking in riddles a little bit there to keep all the other teams on their toes. And the other teams are going to need to be on their toes because Canada, backed by Rob Wing, even with that carrying on their shoulders, they are still the best team that has gone through, I believe, in terms of just how easily they've done it. They've still got the caster's curse, though. Like, the fact that Rob Wing is supporting them isn't necessarily a good thing. We typically... Uh, examples of the past haven't led to uh, casters making good decisions. Though. They have not, and this is the mulligan they expected, the deck they expected, and just went through this pretty easily, made all the more easy by that hyena. Right, well, that is the end of Group F for the day. Let's take one more look at how it's ended up. Canada at the top. 4-1 match record, seven, a positive seven yeah. game record. Given they've lost one, that was three all in one match, uh, which they lost to Malaysia, of course. Right. Uh, that means they've lost two so, other games in their four wins. So what I was going to say earlier, oh. we, we, weren't, we, didn't, we didn't know for sure. If Canada lost this, they would have been second because they still would have had a better game record, I think, than Belgium most of the time. Sure. Okay, I'm good with that. Barring something crazy like a 3-0 loss. Uh, but yeah, Belgium, Canada, Malaysia going to be the three teams progressing from Group F. Great work from them. And an 0-5. We haven't got any 5-0s at all. I thought we might go through the whole thing with no 5-0s or 0-5s. But Kazakhstan didn't let us down. We are not done yet, though. Three games down, two to go. Next up, we're going to be hopping to Group A, witnessing Brazil versus Switzerland. We'll be right back. We're almost there. Quiet down, everyone. This is not like any of our previous expeditions. This will be far more ambitious. We're stepping into a land of primordial wonder. Infused with astonishing elemental energies, Plant life here holds very unusual properties. So don't touch anything. And while you may be excited to see the local fauna, you might want to make sure they don't see you. Because their powers of adaptation are devastating. Make no mistake, we will be tested at every turn. But if we stay on our guard, we might just survive. Now then, are you ready? Then let's journey into Ongoro Crater. 